So what what is the mechanism of this, right? What 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 is causing this LTP? Well, as I've already established, it's highly NMDA receptor dependent. Now, the NMDA receptor, as you know, are voltage dependent, right? That when you have a normal amount of magnesium in the extracellular fluid, if the cell is hyperpolarized, you know, near rest, then no matter how much glutamate is released, no current flows through the ion channel. But as the um, membrane potential is depolarized, these ion channels open. So sort of from minus 40 up, the voltage dependence is removed uh, and a lot of current can pass through these receptors. We also know that EMDA receptors are calcium permeable. So this is a more recent experiment using two photon calcium imaging and a brain slice. Um, and they're uh, uncaging glutamate. So they're making a puff of glutamate appear directly beside the spine. And when they do that, they see a, an EPSP um, and they also see a calcium transient in this dendritic spine or in the spine head. Um, but when they apply AP5, APV, they get basically the exact same size um, voltage change but no calcium. So NMDA receptors are calcium permeable. Those are our first two things. We also know that a burst of intracellular calcium is enough to induce LTP. So this is one of the first experiments where that was ever done. So they've got something known as caged calcium that basically releases calcium in response to a UV light. Here this flashes when they're um, releasing the calcium. Now they're also measuring the extracellular potential, which is you know, measured from thousands of neurons, while this flash only affects the one neuron that they're doing the intracellular recording from. And in that one neuron after the flash, we see the EPSP get bigger, you know, and again for over an hour, while the extracellular signal doesn't change at all, showing it's specific to the cell that had this, um, this, this uncageable calcium. So it you know, a burst of intracellular calcium is enough to reduce LTP. And if you um, put a lot of calcium chelator inside a cell, so again, this uh, can, can basically soak up any of the calcium that gets into the cell, we see that this blocks LTP in much the same way. They've got an extracellular electrode. Um, they apply the tetanus, the high stimulus, uh, high frequency stimulus, and the extracellular electrode sees nice strong LTP. Um, so, you know, for most cells, their synapse has got enhanced, but in the intracellular cell where they could record the actual EPSP and they could put in enough calcium to chelate all of the calcium, sorry, they could put in enough calcium buffer to chelate all the calcium, yeah, they didn't see any LTP, so the EPSP didn't get bigger. Finally, LTP involves the phosphorylation of AMPA receptors. So here is just a, um, now they're using something called a theta burst stimuli, which is still essentially high frequency stimuli. They get nice LTP that lasts for an hour. Uh, and if you don't like blots, I apologize, but um, here they are using phosphate specific antibodies and they see that this um, phosphorylation at serine 831 on the glue R1 subunit of AMPA receptors increases and actually it keeps increasing over time. And then finally, they, we know that long-term stable LTP requires transcription and translation, right? So here is um, a, a, sm a weaker LTP, right? So they stimulate the the field EPSP slope, the size of the field EPSP gets bigger, and then slowly over the course of an hour, so oh, heads back to baseline. But when they apply a very strong um, LTP protocol, they get LTP that goes up and stays up, you know, for, for this 200 minutes. So what is that, three hours? But if they apply um, an, an anisomycin, which blocks translation, so blocks the formation of new proteins, we turn this um, very strong LTP and long lasting LTP into that short form of LTP. While if we block transcription, um, then I said that the wrong way around, right? So if you drop block translation, um, 
is that even the right way around? Point is, if you block protein synthesis, then your LTP doesn't last very long. And how long is very long, right? So this is a recording from Cliff Abrams' lab, who I, I worked in for a year. Um, and what you see is that this time is now in days, right? So this is in vivo recording in a, in a rat hippocampus. They apply the stimuli, the EPSP goes up by 40% uh, and stays up for a year. So what is the mechanism? Well, this is the sort of the textbook explanation, right? That a lot of glutamate is released to a depolarized cell, right? So the depolarization provided through amperoceptors is enough to depolarize the cell, which clears the magnesium blockade from the NMDA receptor and allows calcium to flood in. This activates calcium calmodulin dependent kinase, um, which goes on to um, activate, sorry, it activates calmodulin, which goes on to activate calcium calmodulin dependent kinase, uh, which phosphorylates amperoceptors. It also can do stuff to protein kinase C and potentially nitric oxide the synthase, which could send a retrograde message to change presynaptic behavior. That's at the beginning, but that large calcium signal and all of these uh, phosphorylation events ends up leading to the insertion of new amper receptors and also the um, translation of new amper receptors. So we phosphorylate the amper receptors to make them more high affinity. They respond to glutamate stronger, but we also insert more of them um, just so there are more. And so in total, you get a much larger amount of current. And that is the classical textbook explanation of LTP. Depolarization allows the magnesium channel to open. The calcium influx from it then leads to a collection of cascades that involve phosphorylation of amper receptors, but also the insertion and the synthesis of new amper receptors.